exploring the intersection of resilient technology, organizations, and people. Redeploy. I am really excited to be here. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, I kind of made this uh, really tongue-in-cheek uh, tweet saying that uh, I was kind of humble bragging about my trip up north and I was saying that I was doing some research about my operating on the edge of the envelope. Um, and while I was up there, I actually had a moment that made me realize how close to the edge of the envelope that I actually was. And so mountaineering or sort of alpine climbing, it's you know an extraordinarily hazardous activity. Um, and it, it's made substantially less so by a slow and careful cultivation of expertise. Uh, you develop your practice over many years. You develop a sensitivity to the environment that you are working within. You know, if you're in the mountains, you're on the snow, you're on the glacier. Um, and you really develop a lot of techniques to sort of simulate what might happen. If something's going to go wrong, how do I recover from this? How do I get out of it? Um, and so I am not a, uh, I'm not a software engineer. Um, I don't know what it's like to get sweaty palms as you're about to push code into production. Uh, but I do know what it's like to get sweaty palms when you're hanging out on the edge of a cliff like this. Um, and so I can't like preface that without telling you the story about being on the edge of the envelope. And um, this picture uh, terrifies me. Um, because that is uh, my climbing partner, um, and this is the end of uh, four days that we'd spent um, up at the highest inhabitable structure in the Canadian Rockies at the Neil Colgan Hut. Uh, and we are descending, we've come through a glacier that's full of like climber eating crevasses and uh, repelled off the first hundred foot um, section to come down and we're, we walked across this little ledge and she is uh, just tying in to repel the second um, section. And so you can kind of see at the bottom there, we've both got our anchors, our personal anchors clipped into that bolt. Um, and that's kind of standard practice. It's sort of your fail safe. And then you put your belay device on or your repel device and you kind of tighten it up and you test it. And then you take your personal anchor off and you let it rip and drop off the side of a mountain. Um, and at this particular moment, um, she'd gone through the safety checks. She took her, uh, her repel device or her personal anchor off um, and she went to lean back and something caught her and stopped her. And she looked down and the top of her harness inexplicably uh, had opened. Um, and so this might not mean much to you, but what it means carrying that 50 pound pack was had she actually weighted that device and uh, started to descend, she more than likely would have flipped over backwards and been ripped right out of her harness. Um, and so when we talk about what it means to be operating on the edge of uh, the envelope, um, it, it doesn't matter if you're in the mountains or if you're you know, in the office, when you are tasked with Ha high hazard activity, high risk, high consequence activity, um, there's the, the consequences are real. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about today is some of the techniques, some of the practices, some of the research methods that we use as cognitive systems engineers to really understand how is it that you make sense of very dynamic, very changing, evolving conditions in real time. And that's also given the pressures and constraints of the real world in which we operate. It's windy. It is, uh, you know, there's a, a deployment deadline. Uh, you're short uh, an engineer. These are the conditions of the real world. And that's really where our research lives. So uh, a couple of places where we're going to go today is um, I was listening carefully to the, the conversation yesterday and um, to some of the speakers, and I realized that there's an opportunity for me to kind of uh, give a shout out to you guys and kind of reflect back um, the thing that you do and why it is that we as researchers are really quite interested in your domain. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. And then um, I'm going to clarify 
what the academics, what the uh, you know 30 plus years of systems engineering, cognitive systems engineering research has uh, been debating about um, the definitions of resilience and the ways in which we understand what this means in practice. I'll spend a couple minutes on productive directions for research and then a few little caveats of resilience engineering because this is really a partnership of those who study the work and those who do the work to co-create the solutions for the future. So um, John is really fond of recounting that David Foster Wallace story about um, the fish in the fishbowl. You guys hear, heard this? So um, there's, there's two fish, and they're kind of swimming around in a little fish bowl, and a kind of older, wiser fish comes swimming towards them, and he says, hey, boys, the water's fine. And they're like, yeah, and they swim on, and then the younger fish kind of looks at the other guy and goes, what the heck is water? And to me, that, like, I really like that analogy um, when we are start talking about uh, resilience engineering, because we as researchers are able to really help you identify what is the water that you swim in, how cold is it, how much of it is there, is there a current? Um, and so these are sort of, uh, it's, a, it's a nice analogy, but it doesn't necessarily capture it entirely because what I would posit to you is that you are less of a nice, constrained, clean fishbowl, and you are more like you're swimming in the ocean, which does have those strong currents. There's sharks swimming around. There's maybe some like plastic stuff floating around on the surface, getting in your way, doing what you're doing. Uh, there's a very uh, live and vibrant and dynamic and ever-changing world surrounding you. So I wanted to um, spend a couple of minutes up front here kind of reflecting back to you what it is that we see um, in the work that you are doing. Um, so yesterday, Aaron, I think it was, um, brought up the myth of the sufficiently smart engineer. Uh, you know, that mythical beast who like never makes mistakes and he knows all the things and you know, he's always, a, he's always on his game or her game. Um, and so I wanted to add to that sort of mythology of the fully functioning system. Um, because most of the engineers that I talk to and that we work with through uh, the consortium with, the, uh, with OSU, um, they seem to think that it's only uh, like other companies are running these like sleek and powerful and you know like shiny like systems that don't break in weird ways and there's not a bunch of like you know backlog of corrective actions piling up in the corner um, and so they think that their their engineering teams are super disciplined about about getting things done and um, and that their system is like a finely calibrated Audi R8. Um, and the actual fact, what we see from the research and from spending time in organizations like yours, uh, like nuclear power, uh, healthcare, aviation, all of these other similar sort of high risk, high consequence domains, is that it's actually a little bit more like the chicken bus. <laughs> And so if you've never really seen a chicken bus, they're very popular in, you know, kind of third world countries. Um, and it sort of gives you an idea of what it's about. There is, uh, you know, some, some features that have been strapped on the top and it's kind of bumping along and there's like, you know, the windshield's a little bit cracked and the, no the exhaust is really noisy. Um, and if you are, it doesn't matter how good of a driver you are of the system, it's not going to handle the way the Audi handles. And so a lot of times, the operators within these systems tend to sort of look back and say, well, I must be doing something wrong because I'm supposed to be driving the Audi and it's handling like the chicken bus. So the ever quotable uh, Dr. Cook uh, gives us this lovely saying here. Um, which is that it's not surprising that your system sometimes fails. What's surprising is that it ever works at all. And so what he's speaking to here is that you are operating in very dynamic conditions. You are doing things that are very complicated, that are complex, that are interacting in ways that are difficult to anticipate. 
they're difficult to detect when they do change. And sometimes the failures will happen in ways that are unpredictable and sometimes uncontrollable. So uh, sort of further to that, he talks about how everything within these systems uh, is sometimes broken. Something is always broken. And if nothing seems broken, wait a minute. So the sort of punchline on this is not that you are operating fully formed, fully functional systems. It's that recovery, repair, and revision are ongoing. This is a salient feature of your world and of your environment. And so this kind of seems like maybe a little bit dramatic and seems like it might be um, uh, a little over the top but it has really profound implications for how we design and develop the systems to support the operator or to support the engineer if we think the systems are, uh, or if we know that the systems are operating in degraded modes, if we know that you are influenced by pressures and constraints within this world, you're not operating in a vacuum where you have all the people and all the time and all the resources in the world. So I want to take a couple minutes here because uh, there's a Dane by the name of Jens Rasmussen who wrote a paper in 1997 called Risk Modeling in a Dynamic Society that just like blew my mind. And um, you know, I've spent the last 15 years working in sort of safety and risk management in uh, the natural resource industries. Um, and so I, I'm kind of into this, but uh, I think it's actually something that you'll um, be quite interested in as well. And um, Matt, there was a, there was a, a really interesting connection here um, because I also use this model to reflect on how I as a person can sometimes be drifting towards the edge of the envelope as well. And it kind of gives me little cues to recognize where I need to pivot or where I need to change as well. And so when we talk about, or what, what Yen said, is basically uh, we are in, the, in a system of work, uh, you know, continually shifting about and moving our operating point. Um, and we don't have unlimited resources. We don't have an unlimited space in which to navigate, degrees of freedom in which to navigate. He said there's always constraints in this world. And one of them is going to be cost. And the other one is going to be schedule. So kind of time and money, um, you know, he, he calls it the boundary of economic failure because he's fancier than I am, um, and the boundary of workload. Uh, and basically what he's saying is if you cross these lines, those are pretty clear indications that you are going to uh, fail given the constraints of your environment. So those two, those make sense. Uh, in high hazard environments, we also kind of enclose this ballpark that we play within uh, with what he calls the line of tech, uh, technical failure. Um, and this line is often much less concrete and much less uh, discreet in where it exists. There's not a fixed point where this is. Um, and often in very complex adaptive systems, that line is kind of shifting and it's changing. And so uh, that is also the line where things go boom uh, in a big way, just in case you weren't aware. Uh, and so within this operating space, you have constant pressure to optimize. We're in a resource-constrained environment. Nobody has endless time or endless money to do the things that they need to do. And so we move about this space um, relative to these pressures that we experience. Now, Rasmussen called this kind of Brownian movements, but it's not random. It, it makes sense that if you're uh, being pressed to move up a deadline or to cut some uh, money out of the budget, that you're going to move away from that boundary, but it's going to push you closer uh, to the line of technical failure. So the line of technical failure um, is not a place that you want to hang out by uh, most organizations that are successful that have uh, been operating in their domains for many years recognize this. Um, and so they exert counter pressures. So if we've got the, the, the cost and schedule pressures that are constantly pushing you towards the, um, the line of technical failure, we put things in place like regulations, like rules, like safe work procedures, like 
safety culture stand downs. These sorts of things that kind of create uh, a, a buffer between uh, failure and um, this navigating this space. And so this sort of counter pressure creates this uh, line, this, this, uh, this margin of maneuver, I suppose, from what the company finds is tolerable and reasonable for how close to that line you're going to get. And this is going to be different depending on uh, where the organization is at, uh, the type of constraints in their environment, the type of competition that they face. Uh, and so we're continually sort of moving about this space again, being aware of that line. But the closer, the more times that you kind of broach that line and inevitably cross the invisible line without consequences, what do we think happens? We move the line a little bit closer because it's waste. That slack in the system or that uh, margin of maneuver doesn't really seem necessary anymore. Uh, so we start to erode that line um, towards the line of technical failure. And of course, the only time that we know whether or not we have sufficient margin of maneuver is when we actually cross the line and invoke an accident. And then we realize, oh, there it is, there's that line. Uh, and what we see as a result of that is generally that that, that operating point moves way back. The line um, that we set up, the counter pressures become very strong and we push that uh, margin of maneuver out again. So this is a constant play uh, for organizations that are handling sort of high hazard, high risk work. Uh, so the thing about um, this world and these conditions is that when you're operating sort of in the middle of that, of that zone, um, Though that kind of area, these are really easily modeled conditions. These We know we can build run books for how things are going to go wrong here. Uh, we can develop training programs to kind of help people understand how to move in this space. Uh, we can write really prescriptive rules that say do this or do that or don't do that. Um, and it, we get a lot of feedback about sort of like how, how things work in this area. But when we approach the margins, it becomes a little more gray around this area. It's harder to predict how things are going to fail, how quickly they're going to fail, what sorts of things might help you recover and re remove yourself from that uh, situation. We see a lot more cascading effects at, this, at the boundaries. Um, and this sort of constant change that exists in the modern work world means that those boundaries are constantly shifting. And so uh, it, makes, it makes those boundaries even less certain of where they actually exist. So when we're operating um, at the boundaries, we also see that the pace of work, the tempo of things can sometimes increase, which diminishes the ability to detect whether things are trending down or whether they're sort of trending up. Um, it allows, it gives us less time to be able to diagnose and resolve some of the issues. Uh, and it requires that, because it's not in that sort of predictable um, domain, that it requires novel ways to bring your knowledge to bear and to be able to make sense of the situation. So what uh, my advisor, David Woods, is very fond of saying, in those boundary conditions, there be dragons. Uh, and so what he's referring to here is this sort of like unpredictable and uncertain uh, aspects of these, of these boundary conditions. So another way that the resilience engineering community really talks about boundary conditions is about brittleness. Uh, and so when we talk about brittleness, we recognize that uh, the system doesn't gr degrade gracefully. It doesn't kind of go in this like sad little deflating balloon collapse. It's often very rapid uh, and very uncontrolled and very cascade types of failures that happen when we're operating out in these boundary conditions. So. Um, yesterday, someone had asked uh, what we can learn from other domains or, you know, even what a sort of business critical SRE team could learn from like an entertainment site like Netflix. Um, and th this is really it 
uh, this is kind of getting to the crux of what we can learn from each other, is that smart, competent, experienced, uh, technical people who work in time-pressured, goal-conflicted, resource-constrained, rapidly changing environments um, have similar kinds of demands on their attention, uh, whether you're a pilot or whether you're a doctor or whether you're an astronaut or a software engineer. And so uh, I'll pull on kind of 30 years of research from these types of domains. John mentioned sort of, you know, what we've done in uh, Three Mile Island from nuclear power. Um, we've worked in military analysis intelligence, uh, software fab manufacturing, all sorts of different environments. And some of the common themes that we see is that our systems are running in degraded modes. We're driving a version of the chicken bus. They are being in a state of near continuous change incurs increasing levels of complexity. So those two are very synonymous as the more change that we are seeing within the system, the more complexity that the operators at the sharp end of the sticks are being uh, forced to cope with. Uh, there's a demand for near perfect performance and reliability. This one sits well with this crowd um, in the sense that uh, your, um, your clients don't want downtime. They expect that they should be able to access your service um, on an ongoing basis. Uh, the, they're distributed across time and space. And so um, this creates all sorts of new and interesting needs for coordination, uh, for the tools that allow us to sort of lower the cognitive costs that are involved with uh, drawing in new sources of information about the changing states of the system, uh, parsing out the work to be able to um, resolve an issue, and then bringing it back together and sort of synthesizing and coordinating that response team. Uh, and they increasingly involve external dependencies. Uh, so it's not just other departments or other sort of silos within the organization or other teams, other individuals. Um, we have vendor relationships that are starting to crop up that are business critical functions um, and all sorts of interesting implications around, well, they're not part of our business, so they don't necessarily, we don't have the same transparency we don't have the same sense of urgency about resolving certain issues. And we may not even have the types of channels or mechanisms to be able to communicate in real time that the crisis or the event uh, really demands. And so the bottom line is that many of these environments don't support cognitive work very well. So how are people making sense of these environments? How do we help them uh, kind of create more of a margin for maneuver, make sense of these very disparate uh, sources of information, and very quickly and, efficient and effectively uh, coordinate across these networks. So um, the academic world, so it's been mentioned, I guess, several times over the last couple of days, uh, you know, that there's different sort of definitions of resilience. Um, and even when it's not explicitly mentioned that someone has a different definition of resilience, uh, you get the sense that one interpretation is a little bit different from another. And so this can generate a lot of noise um, and, a, and a lot of confusion about what is it that people really mean uh, when they say resilience. Um, and so while this kind of debate can be uh, useful and fruitful in sort of early stages, um, the concepts, er, in early stages as the concepts are emerging, um, what we see is that some of the theories and some of the ideas pr uh, provide some really productive um, lines of inquiry. Uh, so being able to kind of parse out what we mean by different concepts of resilience can help to improve the progress forward. Uh, so this is taken from a paper uh, by Dave Woods. Um, and he's really sort of delineating the key terms that we're seeing in domains like governance. Uh, we see a lot of business continuity uh, organizations and researchers trying to understand uh, resilience, a lot of uh, psychology and sort of individual emotional kind of resilience. Um, and I'll admit that when I first kind of started digging into the debate, I started thinking, okay, well, this is a lot of academic splitting of hairs. 
Um, but as you start to unpack them, you realize, no, these are really fundamental ways of thinking about how do we design and develop and organize and resource these teams to be able to adapt and to be able to respond. So they are uh, rebound, resilience as robustness, resilience as graceful extensibility, and resilience as sustained adaptability. And so the first uh, two here, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll move fairly quickly through these. Um, but uh, when we look at rebound as basically the ability to sort of recover from surprise and to return to a previous normal functioning. Um, and you know, a lot of the research here has been used to describe communities that have suffered, say, a natural disaster um, or individuals who are responding and reacting to challenging life events uh, or businesses that are recovering from extreme uh, weather events. And so what the research has found here when we're talking about resilience as rebounding um, is that it's not so much about the period of recovery, but what's important is the period leading up to the event. So what is the capacities, what are the resources, what has, what has been available to aid in that response before it's actually needed? Um, and so Lagadec uh, in 1993 uh, said that the event in some ways in this concept can be considered a brutal and abrupt audit. At a moment's notice, everything that was left unprepared becomes a very complex problem and every weakness comes rushing to the forefront. So uh, resilience as rebound, the early sort of work in this kind of started us thinking, okay, so there's something about capacity, about ability to maneuver, um, about what is, what is possible before the event that's important in resilience. So the second uh, interpretation is resilience as robustness. And this is sort of the ability to absorb uh, perturbations within the system. So it can, when we look at resilience in this sense, we can say, okay, there's a set of disturbances that the system can handle and can respond to uh, correctly and a lot of, or respond to effectively. And so a lot of this is based on what is the well-modeled, what are the predictable types of failures that we're going to face and then be able to defend against those uh, fairly successfully. And so that's a fairly reasonable thing to do, figure out what's gonna go wrong and then try and protect against that. Um, but it really only works in those conditions where the disturbances are well modeled. And sometimes when we create robustness, we're actually introducing new sources of complexity and new types of challenges for the frontline operators uh, to be able to uh, adapt. And so resilience in this way doesn't really answer that question about like, well, what happens when the system is challenged outside of what we think and predict um, could happen. So the third uh, definition around resilience is to do with graceful extensibility. And so this is looking at how do the systems stretch to handle surprise. Uh, and so this really talks about res uh, resilience as the opposite of brittleness. So if we know that operating in those boundary conditions can create that uh, rapid collapse of the system, how do we understand and design and develop ways in which the system then can cope with uh, being outside of its operating conditions um, and sort of move forward to be able to adapt to new challenges and be opportunistic about taking advantage of opportunities that might exist there. Uh, and so graceful extensibility is a play on the words of graceful degradation. Um, and while graceful degradation just looks at, well, how do you, how do you collapse? How do things break down effectively? Uh, you know, Woods has said, well, it can be very positive as well and can actually help um, enhance the, the qualities of the system. Uh, so in the research here sort of uh, surfaced a lot of interesting findings about how um, systems with high graceful extensibility were able to anticipate where were bottlenecks uh, likely to occur uh, and to be able to anticipate what types of resources and what types of responses would be able to circumvent that, that type of failure, that type of disruption. 
So in this way, uh, resilience is really about the readiness to respond and the ability to adjust to, um, to fit the challenges. And then so uh, the most sort of current iteration of uh, the definition of resilience has kind of moved towards sustained adaptability. So as, as the research has kind of progressed, we start to see things that don't really fit these older models or these older definitions. Um, and the most recent definition around sustained adaptability uh, is the ability to manage these adaptive capabilities of layered network systems to produce sustained adaptability over longer scales. And so this is very relevant to this domain, and this is kind of part of what makes this very interesting for uh, resilience researchers. Uh, is that we're starting to look at, we have systems of systems that influence and uh, constrain and put pressure on each other. Um, they exist across scales, across uh, both uh, time and space. Um, and they are, they're really what we see that creates the ability to sort of have sustained adaptation over time. Uh, so a lot of this is kind of drawn from the biological world of well, how, how are things uh, evolving and um, addressing system dynamics over a life cycle or over multiple life cycles. And so the, the thrust of the research here is looking at what is the governance structures, what are the architectures that help to explain the difference between these types of networks that have been able to successfully adapt over time um, and those that fail to adapt. Uh, we also start looking at in this type of research is what kind of design principles and techniques would allow you to engineer a network like this? How do we build this, bake this into the structure of our tools and of our, our organizations? Um, and then lastly, the question is, how, how do we know if we've succeeded? You know, if those brutal audits are uh, the sort of metric of success and failure, what are indications in these types of worlds that, that tell us that we are pointed in the right direction? So um, the four sort of concepts of resilience, so again, it kind of helps us to sort of parse out when you hear different talks and different interpretations of that, what are we speaking to? And then what does that actually, where do we go from there? What's the progress that can be made from those types of interpretations? So uh, I, I you know, kind of foreshadowed a little bit in that sort of reflecting back to you what, was, what we found interesting, um, but I can kind of summarize that in three sort of key points of why this domain is very interesting to us as researchers. Uh, we like risk and we like failure, and you definitely have spectacular uh, examples of both of those. Um, and you know, what, what's important about this is that increasingly our critical global infrastructure is, is dependent on how experts like yourselves are able to cope with the additional complexity that's inherent in the systems and the tasks that you are, um, uh, that you're responsible for in trying to keep these systems upright. Uh, we see really high profile outages in airline travel, in our financial markets, uh, in uh, 911 call systems, communication systems, um, transportation networks, access to healthcare records. Uh, so this is not going away, um, and we're only getting increasingly dependent on these services. So while it might might be important on a local level, you know, as Nora said yesterday, uh, to an individual who might be suffering from depression to get access to uh, their Netflix account, the sort of meta conversation there is that what Nora and Aaron are doing and, and the rest of the uh, Netflix team is they're devising ways to help aid practitioners in understanding the patterns and behaviors that exist within their systems. Uh, and so those are the sorts of things that we are very interested in and how does this extrapolate and how do we apply this to other types of domains. So surprise is a normal and expected part of operations. Uh, I have been fortunate to spend the last two summers with an SRE team um, who is tasked with uh, you know, service ownership from a number of different tools. Um, and it, it always impresses me how they 
tuck and roll with what comes across. Uh, and you know, getting to sort of really unpack the ways in which they are working the tooling and working the teaming um, to be able to adapt is uh, quite valuable. Little shout out for my dissertation research, which will be on cost of coordination as well. Uh, so stay tuned. Um, and lastly, uh, highly abstracted systems that are characterized by continual change and, and complexity. So as I said, this isn't going away. These are, these are only problems that are going to have more and more relevance as we move forward. So how am I doing for time? I totally, okay, we're good. All right. Um, so when we talk about sort of production, uh, productive directions uh, for research, um, this, is, this is what we are keen on, what we are keen on, on exploring. Um, and so, so it's reciprocal in the sense that, uh, you know, the water that you swim in sort of informs our knowledge about how to effectively cope with complexity and to operate at the boundary. Um, and how do we design and develop these systems? Um, and then, sec and, and not only the systems, but the tools that we are using within those systems to help sort of highlight change in events and anomalous events as they're, as they're happening. Um, and so I put these up here for, for two reasons. Is one, because research engineering, you know, I think as, as John mentioned in his talk, it takes place in these natural laboratories. We don't we don't put uh, practitioners into a simulated environment and say, how do you figure this out? We work side by side uh, with uh, people who are doing real work in real conditions. Uh, so if you see something here that resonates, you know, partnering with a researcher really creates that opportunity, really invaluable uh, opportunities to sort of co-create some of the future, future solutions. Um, and then secondly, because I think this domain has really taken some huge strides uh, with people like Mary and Paul and Nora and, you know, the other Lundians uh, in the crowd and other people who have sort of uh, taken these ideas and started to put them into practice and really kind of pressed up against them to see how do they work and what does it mean. Uh, and so we're hoping to sort of channel energy and direction uh, within some very specific ways. Um, and so what is interesting, what we hope that the future of uh, resilience engineering within the digital services domain uh, includes is how is it that adaptive systems fail in general? So the more knowledge that we have about these patterns uh, of decompensation um, on both a local level and across scales is important to know. Um, how is it that systems can be prepared for inevitable surprise? If we know that this is going to happen, um, you know, how do we sort of architect this and design this, engineer this into your system, uh, while still recognizing that there are real world constraints on this? You're not gonna have a you know, group of engineers that just get paid to sit around and be poised and ready to jump in whenever they're needed. Um, there is pressures to be efficient and to optimize. Uh, on those resources. And so what mechanisms can allow a system to manage the risk of brittleness at the boundaries of normal functioning? So what are, what's the tooling? What's the ways in which the teams are orchestrated? What are the ways in which your vendor relationships are orchestrated if they become a very critical part of your uh, response efforts? And then what architectures allow systems to sustain adaptability over time and over multiple cycles of change? So again, you know, looking forward to the future, what we see now in, in how systems are dependent on each other or how they are um, currently structured, um, what does this look like as time goes on and as they grow and change? So with that, um, I have a couple of uh, points of caveats of resilience engineering in practice. Um, and these are maybe partially, they're partially aspirational and they're partially cautionary tales perhaps. Um, 
the first one that I would say is that, you know, there's a tendency with a concept like resilience that this is very intuitive, like we know what it means and, um, you know, we can apply it in, in our own sort of interpretation in our own ways. Um, but I really want to drive home the point that this is a, there's a very rigorous and methodical approach um, to how we explore resilience. And so it looks different than the results that you're seeing. You know, we gather narratives, we, you know, do a lot of qualitative research, um, we bring together multiple divergent viewpoints, and we refuse to oversimplify those. So you might not see nice little packaged best practices because it's context dependent. Um, so the, the second sort of piece of that, which is tightly coupled there, is to beware of oversimplifications, including your own. Um, so the prescriptions for sort of operating in these very dynamic um, conditions have yet to be written. Um, and they are, as I said, sort of uh, very context dependent. So those who can kind of claim to deploy resilience the same way people who claim to be able to deploy DevOps sort of in your organization, um, you know, if they are describing the water that you swim in and it is contradictory or conflicting to your experience, that's a, a good indication that perhaps they're, they may not be looking at the problem as broadly as you need to to, to resolve these types of um, issues. Uh, so the next one, um, it's great that, you know, to share stories about what works in one company um, or in one sort of configuration of tooling and teams, um, but it doesn't give legs to become a de facto standard in theory. And so this is one that I will like cop to being, you know, as a new researcher, you go out into an organization and you're like, I figured it out. This is what resilience is. And um, many times I have had uh, my advisors kind of come back and saying like, yeah, that's an indication of resilience, but let's not sort of jump to conclusions because there's a lot of resources that get invested in those types of uh, conclusions. There's a lot of directions that can detract from other really productive sort of lines of inquiry as well. Uh, and the last one, the interesting features of resilience can be difficult to detect and measure. And so I know that you guys want to measure and that metrics are important and this is like kind of the first conversation that you almost always have when you start up a new, you know, project or initiative. Um, but we are still very much trying to figure out what are indications of resilience? How do you know if this is working? How do you know if a team is going to be able to anticipate and adapt and respond in ways that are constructive and productive uh, for the organization, both at a sort of local level and a, a more global level? Uh, so. As I mentioned somewhat briefly, um, I am with The Ohio State University, the Cognitive Systems Engineering Lab. Uh, we do have a consortium of um, uh, different sort of digital service uh, organizations. I think shout out to Salesforce and New Relic who are in the room today um, and who are a part of our consortium. Um, we did sort of produce the stellar report. We have another sort of second cycle that is underway right now. Uh, where we have re researchers embedded within the organizations and we are really sort of working with, the, with these teams to understand what's interesting, what's challenging, how do we aggregate this across the members of the uh, consortium. Uh, so those are my contact details. I, I love talking about this stuff and um, could do so endlessly. Um, but the other thing that I will say is that as a PhD student, you are always asked to read and read, read. Uh, so I would kind of pass along to yourselves as well to read more, um, to ask those better questions and really keep the dialogue going. We've had a, an incredible couple of days here, um, a lot of ideas, a lot of different perspectives, and a lot of really interesting ways to carry this on and carry this forward. Um, if you're not a reader, there's also some videos. Um, members of our lab have been out and about in the world, and I believe that uh, these are going to be posted, uh, so you should have a, a copy of that um, if you need it. So with that, um, I hope that uh, I'm not standing awkwardly in the back by myself afterwards. I hope that you really come over and kind of tell me what you think, even if you didn't like it or you did like it. And um, I look forward to seeing you again next year.